Welcome to the Living Room Online Literary Series, produced and hosted by M. L. Liebler, internationally recognized Michigan poet, editor, publisher, literary activist, university professor, and performance artist. Number 20 of the series, this program was presented February 25th, 2021, and features the poetry of Ron Padgett, Chris Tisch, and George Tisch. And now, here is M.L. Liebler. So we've got, uh, we've got these great poets with us tonight and a great audience here and likely um, many, many more on Facebook. We usually have something like a couple hundred or 300. Not to make you nervous, George, uh, that there's, a, it's like being on the Ed Sullivan Show. So this is uh, pre uh, presented by the Detroit Writers Voice and Poets and Writers in New York City. Uh, we're very grateful to them. They've been uh, helping me do things since uh, the early 90s and they're still going strong, so that's great. Um, we're also on Facebook so people can uh, post questions and things like that as we move through the Facebook uh, program and then also in, in the chat here. Uh, Ron's agreed to do a little Q&A afterwards. So we're going to start with, um, with George. I want to, because not everybody out there is going to be familiar with all of the uh, biographies of people. So I'm going to give a sort of formal biography so everybody has an idea um, of the folks who will be reading. We're going to start with George and then we'll have Chris and we will finish with, um, uh, with Ron Padgett. George teaches film studies and poetics at the College for Creative Studies in Detroit. He's a recipient of the 2015 Kresge Artist Fellowship. His recent books, books include a thousand, a, thousand, a thousand Words and Others from Blaze Vox Books, uh, 2020, uh, The Slip, and the imperfect from United Artist uh, Lewis Warsh's Great Press, uh, 2010. So please welcome to our stage in the living room, in front of the fireplace, there, uh, George Tish. Thank you very much. <clears throat> Can you all hear me? Is that okay? Louder. Is that okay? All right. Now you made me shut off my light. I can't see my text. So <laughs> now I can see it. Uh, it looked good, I, though. Yeah, I'm going to read a, a few poems from the end of the series called A Thousand Words. It's uh, basically 100 pages of 10 words per page. And the, the, the words are lined up in a column so that there's really one word per line going down the page. Uh, this is towards the end. Kitchen window like a Tang Dynasty scroll, top lit at sunset. Writings that disarm us with their quiet memories of madness. It breaks the evening lament, its flowing grass of signs. As the tide pulls away from the shore, we wave. Tottering heels, dans la rue, the night eats its own. Awake after sleep, magnolia voices, chrysanthemum morning, their mortal song. When words fail, there's always humidity, bugs, and concerti grossi. Not snow roof, nor hirsute concupiscence, just Chinese characters adrift. Lyric begets like. Affect after art, like Snickers, like Chuckles. 
puts on a great coat for the cold and goes out. Certain feelings interfere with words, their letters blurred by Or do we want to hear about what you did? Moving from place to place like a clod or dickwad. Big universe is beyond comparison, also home of big dummy. There's a, a second part of this book called, the first part is a thousand words and then the second part is and others. And I'll just like to read a couple of poems from there. And the poems in the second part are set up a little bit more conventionally. This is called Yunnan, which is uh, the province in China. Yunnan, three bells announced the start of not attending to ideas. Puer mountains on literati scrolls by priceless assassins layered in winter. Pouring spicer over crushed ice, poor bastards garnished from outside. Piano noodling before tenor solo boils over into 60s soul. No mas or no moss, at best a lasting loss. We can't feel it anymore, the cupidity of this time. So fly away from here to come back in again. When Ed Coleman is a mammal, thought Michael McClure decades ago. This is called Debussy. You wafted in some freshly cut hydrangeas like a florist, then reordered the sitting room windows before raising them chromatically to let in the longing night clouds that cool it. This is called Beginner's Mind. <clears throat> I like this juxtaposition between the changing and the unchanging. Here it's morning or evening, depending on whose dream applies. Mood for mood, the indigo nail shine matches your heels. Available in black and white, hard bop with hard labor. In this winter, those trees were whitewashed with lime. Chrysanthemum logic of chilled water in the naked white desert. Moments notice that cool rain above a pond in wind. They promise to the up, excuse me, they promise to rise up for anyone else but us. In front of them, a garden with beautiful wisteria blooms. And uh, this is, this is the last piece from the book that I'll read. It's called Villa Verlaine. It's the name of the street that we like to live on in Paris. When we go there, it's up in the 19th. It's a, it's a street without any, uh, without any cars on it. It's all just cobblestones for, for pedestrians. Villa Verlaine. During the spring, summer, and fall, someone was singing in a room nearby France is still France. And as I strained to listen, three small clouds appeared in my memory of creation and anarchy. So that I walked over wet paving stones as little French children laughed and cried, workmen of all countries unite. And then I'm just gonna finish up with a, a couple of pieces from a new series that I'm working on called 26 Tears. And it's got a preface, it's got a, a, an epilogue by Lorenzo Thomas, the great Lorenzo Thomas. Jazz solos against space, feeling the people sigh. And it's an abecedaria, so the, each poem starts, each poem is titled A, B, C, D, etc. So the first poem is although, the second one is burning, etc. <clears throat> There's only 26 poems in the series. I'm only going to read three or four of these. Although three figures make steady progress in a field, drainage continues to be an issue, which is what dreaming about work can achieve when two machines wrap things up 
Another speaks of holy terror forms of interruption whose unlap unhappy labor nears an end. Burning. Uh, this title came to me from seeing this incredible film by Lee Chang Dong from Korea called Burning. If anybody's seen that film, it's amazing. It seemed appropriate to, to what I was writing about. Burning, they're almost done, the moldy fucks who made us nuts and wiped away the darker joys. Horrendous MacArthur, odiferous Nixon, excremental Trump. As we think a little each day, the results become erotically lubricated in this empty arena, an illusion of explanatory death. Irene Welsh, you should shut off your thing, thank you. <laughs> Cupfuls of eponymous liquid drip to the sidewalk as we stroll the blazing noonday strand. It says fantasies don't matter at all, while into every mind on the sunlit boulevards they pour from the skies of America. And just a couple more. Eternal starlings bathe their primitive torsos abstractly in the chazubachi, filled with teardrops, promising radiant depths then butt dial calls to a creator beyond twinkling stars in a vacant sunset. And the last one is called friction. Friction between indistinct objects temporarily arranged on a table, different, gilded, gilded and delicate, opens private eyes to floating surfaces of begonias and coreopsis, flowers looking as if they had bloomed. Thank you. And I just wanted to say it's a great privilege to read with Rob Padgett. Thank you, George Tish. Uh, thanks, George. Um, you know, I meant to say also, and uh, we'll say a couple times, that uh, the books, George Tish's books, uh, Chris's and uh, Ron's, are available at the BookBeat. So uh, you can go to thebookbeat.com or call there uh, and Carrie will, and Colleen will be happy to, to service you uh, and get you the books right away. And they're actually kind of quicker than Amazon. How about that? Go, so go to the book beat. And there might probably is some signed copies of, of George's book there, his new one. Um, next is Chris Tish, and I'm gonna tell folks a little bit about her. Chris was born and raised in Paris, studied American literature at the Sorbonne. Poet and playwright, Chris is the author of several collections of poetry and drama and has received fellowships from the National Endowment for the Arts and the Kresge uh, Foundation. Uh, her latest projects include Derry Da's In Voice, Blaze Vox 2020, so it's a new book. Uh, the Hotel de Archives, a trilogy, Station uh, Hill Press, uh, which features transcreations from the French novels of Samuel Beckett, Jean Genet, Marguerite Duras, uh, with Detroit filmmaker Oren Goldenberg. She has collaborated on a, cinep a cinepoem, Alms of the Night She Teaches with Me at Wayne State University. Please welcome Chris Tisch. Hi, can you hear me okay? Yeah, I can. Um. Thank you, Emma, for the invite. Uh, I'd like to uh, read from my new book that came out uh, smack in the middle of the pandemic. So this will be kind of my launch. Um, the book is called uh, Derrida's Invoice because it's um, based on a book by Jacques Derrida, the French philosopher, the founder of deconstruction. Uh, a book uh, that was published by Chicago University Press uh, in translation in 1980. Uh, it's called The Postcard from Socrates to Freud and Beyond. And I'm sort of channeling uh, a few of the lines from the first section that really reads like a love uh, um, novel. It's epistolary. Uh, I'm just using uh, the lines uh, as titles. Um, so I'll read a few of those, but I'd like to read uh, the epigraph. Um, the epigraph is from uh, Gilles Deleuze and uh, Félix Gattari, and it reads, uh, how to be 
become a nomad and an immigrant and a gypsy in relation to one's own language. And uh, part of my dedication is for the caravans of the displaced, the migrants and the refugees may you find sheltering skies along the way. And I really hope that our current administration uh, works to reunite the 500 plus children and to grant citizenship to all the dreamers. So this book is based on a bunch of constraints. I won't um, mention all of them, but uh, some of them have to do with uh, the presence of French expressions. Uh, some others have to do with uh, putting a cultural reference in it. So without borrowing, nothing happens. Sans emprunt, rien ne commence. Darkness mirrors a sense of malaise, where rubber meets road, a doorway to what comes next. Au revoir les enfants. Chance will never abolish coup de torchon, direction Bertrand Travernier, 1981, on the eve of World War II. In a forsaken colonial town of French West Africa, Eddie Michel, bad boy of French rock and roll, plays Nono, a moronic, Lubricious layabout dressed in the marinière and cotton pedal pushers. Tricolore, bougnoul, need I say more? Fuck the empire and its muddy rivers. El pueblo unido, yama sera vincido. Frederick Jewski, piano composition, 1975. In a letter from Black Mountain College, April 22nd, 1957, John Wieners writes to Schuyler, dearest Jimmy, Bring an excitement form-wise, not just word-wise excitement, but the twist of the hip this way before Frank O'Hara's tight pants, poetics, throw shade on noun and verbs, cheat sheets taped to the top of my skirt. Um, tomorrow I'll write to you again in our foreign tongue. Demain je t'écrirai encore dans notre langue étrangère. The thread that ties this text lies in the scattered fragments I carry in the ball of my dress. Like stolen coal, thin ice on railroad racks. From the outset, the relational shifters of discourse, pronouns in particular, that orphan IU structure held a récit in place, the way she stopped to pinch the seam on a whole grain loaf. Père Le Fil, lose track of the film, I mean dream, so resplendent just a minute ago behind my eyelids, awakened by the early bird caucus, I harbor an intense sensation, au creux de l'estomac, une sueur froide, unbuttons my shirt still wet, lampe de cheveux qui s'allume au toucher, siphons the perpetual flow of images, ebbing now across the lit up room. The architect of rumble strips, bande de sonore, goes out the door tout doucement. Lost in translation, director Sofia Coppola, 2003, tips the soundtrack towards silence, scarlet pink undies notwithstanding, mouthing sweet things in the Tokyo bar. Sayonara, motherfucker. I've become your wife. Je suis devenue ta femme. During the Prague Spring, a month after Russian tanks roll into the city, cut across street signs painted over, causing the convoys to rumble east and west and back again, lost monkey wrench up their ass, cobblestones and even ground at dawn. The virtuosity of rebellion, music to our ears, drawing time in five four piano, alto sax, ba bass and drums. A girl, just married in a thin madras dress, stands on Portobello Road, fingering dark velvet, silk, and linen. Vintage threads placed like a fan of days past, cigarette à la main. The stranger flicks a fag and a thigh level, now in flames, syncope. Stands up break in the general collapse of senses, autrement dit, Anastasia. One needs to heed the code, mood and structure, verbal arrangement between words and world. The presence of the body in each versograph alerts the reader to piecemeal subjectivity. La femme en morceau, other slogans will follow. Sometimes I wish I was illegible to them. Parfois je souhaite que tout leur reste illigible. 
nothing so strange as Adomuka Sasana, downward facing dog, illegible. These vast American cities, Baltimore, Cincinnati, Detroit, ragged, crumbling piers, abandoned like Moses in the bow rushes of the Nile. True that, as per the wire, David Simon, 2002 clip parlance. In the scribble chords of the theme song, something ruined occluded, not meant to be brought back from the dead, tongues falling away on Dante behind a steep bluff. A narrative emerges, a premise, a promise, in spite of the text's effort to front its own unreadability, what eludes the human sensorium, or perhaps sacre les yeux, depending on your standpoint, is the foolishness of being right, more foreign than the thin handwriting on the back of an old photograph to a groovy chick. Only groove I find in a pocket dictionary means fur, rut, a trench. This whole va-et-vient to and fro movement of discourse spoofs up my checkered skirt as I step on the metro grate. And um, maybe, uh, uh, maybe two more. Uh, the telephone lady in Proust, la dame du téléphone chez Proust, couldn't fathom that the short pshit pshit hiss of an oxygen tank during the quietest part of Shostakovich's fifth was a sure sign or omen like an eclipse or walking under a ladder that no man could ignore. Shrill electric bell echoes down my spine. La guerre est finie. Direction à la Renée, 1966. And the police in the slip is here as long as you can hear bodies maneuvering algorithm, a sea of sound roaring to a stop. Ants in the pants have outlived every idiom of restlessness, incessant, la lutte des classes, présage, the end of the poem, Giorgio Agamben, 1996. And um, I'll read one last one. With a stroke of the pen or scraper, I'll derail everything. In coming home, director Jean Gimou, 2014, Gongli's face smooth as a snowy step, peers into a station crowd for her returning husband 10 years behind bars. While unseen by her, he takes it all in, leaving aside for now the loaded loop of who sees whom, quilted coat, scarf, homemade sign, reminding me of Ezra Pound's The River Merchant's Wife, a letter, Cafe 1915. I grow older. If you are coming down through the narrows of the River Kyang, please let me know beforehand and I will come out to meet you as far as Cho Fu Sa. The very logic of longing she rehearses on the fifth of every month that Gongli's character is both the site of historical amnesia and a placeholder for the past opens the ledger to a different account slash marks on history's page. With the click of a mouse, I could delete the whole scene, boo, like Casper's ghost, only it's Mao's specter that wafts on the rim of our nostrils, lips, chest, paws, the ground by the blackened gates, the guards not close on the last voyager. Will the new task or oh, translators be to run along the tracks of sound and scent or discharged or yet unsaid? Thank you very much. Fantastic. Wow. Hey, Carrie or Colleen, if you're watching or listening, throw Chris's uh, new book in my basket too. Yeah, I got it. That's good. Good stuff. Um, thanks, well, I want Chris. to show the cover. Is that okay? Yeah. It it's a cover by Sarkis, a world-renowned artist who's celebrating his 80th. That cover goes perfect in my uh, performance art class, which I know there's some of my students are out there right now. Okay. Uh, Ron Padgett. Poet, editor, translator, Ron Padgett was born in Tulsa, Oklahoma. I've played Tulsa before, Ron. 
As a high school student, he founded the avant-garde literary journal, The White Dove Review, with his friends and fellow students, Joe Brainerd and Dick Gallup, soliciting and publishing work from poets such as Allen Ginsberg and Robert Creeley. The magazine ran for five issues. Paget moved to New York City in 1960 to attend Columbia College, awarded uh, a Fulbright in 65. Paget spent a year in Paris, Fr in Paris, France, studying, translating French poetry. He eventually made his home in New York City's East Village and became a vital part of the second generation of New York school uh, poets, a group that included Brainard, the great Ted Berrigan, Alice Notley, Bill Berkson, and others. In 2018, Paget received the Frost Medal and the Poetry Society of America presented for a distinguished lifetime achievement in poetry. The author of only, o, over 20 collections of poetry, including Big Cabin 2019, uh, collected poems, which uh, I have here, I have a visual to hold up. And that is a book right there from Coffee House Press. I think I bought it in Minneapolis and had it had a card at home. Um, and he, uh, he, he is a winner of many awards and NEAs and all kinds of things. Uh, he's also th did the poetry uh, in that, uh, what I think is a great film, Patterson. As I was watching that film, um, having worked in Patterson quite a bit over the last 25 years, uh, I was listening to the poems and they were blowing me away and uh, only to find out Ron wrote those poems. So uh, made it even tastier to me. Please welcome back to the Detroit screen, Ron Padgett. Okay, can you hear me now? Can anyone hear me? Oh, okay. Uh, well, thank you, ML. Thank you for having me uh, on your show here. Uh, what a special treat it is to be here with, with George and Chris Tisch, uh, wonderful poets and good friends now for, do the math guys, 55 years we've been friends. So let's, let's do another few more, okay? <laughs> All right. But you, you, you didn't read long enough. I wanted you guys to read longer. Uh, you said you were going to read 15 minutes. You tricked me. So I'm going to read 15 minutes. But so anyway, these are all poems written uh, in the last um, 10 months. I've uh, been up here in nor northern Vermont, uh, hiding out from Covis and uh, with nothing to do but scribble. So here we go. Against the grain. Once in a museum, I saw the Bible on a grain of rice or something to that effect. They even had it displayed under a microscope. I saw words, but wasn't gonna stand there and read the entire Bible. I've never stood anywhere long enough to read the entire Bible. I've never even read the entire Bible. This morning though, I did eat a bowl of rice with hot milk, sugar, butter, and salt. Imagine how many Bibles I ate. <clears throat> One gag line I liked as a child was, who hit Betty Grable in the navel with a bagel? I didn't know what a bagel was, though I certainly knew who Betty Grable was and a navel though I had never seen hers, as navels were too risque to show in films. But why anyone would want to hurl a bagel at Betty Grable's navel was far beyond me. And I laughed and remembered that moment for the rest of my life. And no matter how the poor taste of that gag, I'm sorry, and no matter the poor taste of that gag, I still say it to myself as I walk down a crowded street and it makes me feel, for a moment, like a bagel. <laughs> In Mexico, at 16, I saw a play in Spanish, a language I didn't know. 
And at one point, a man with a mustache crashed through a wall and sat on a chair. No one paid him the slightest attention. So I'm saluting him now, 61 years late. I thought 2020 was gonna be an amusing year, a great year, like perfect eyesight. Look out the window and whoop, the year disappears into a robin redbreast. I almost didn't know what day it is and then I did, clicked into time suddenly more secure that it's Thursday, which means nothing, or next to nothing. I am next to nothing. It's in this room with me, an old pal. Somebody has a strange, uh, they're, they're, uh, they're unmuted, and I keep hearing uh, like a sound of a distant railroad train which I heard when I was four and five years old near the house I lived in in Tulsa. It's a rather nice sound. Thank you, Ron. I'm sorry about that. I'll mute myself now. That's, that's okay. me. No, I, I enjoyed, enjoyed it. it. Thank you, kid. That was great. <laughs> I just took out a ruler and measured the dictionary that I had guessed was seven by five by two inches. And guess what? It was. I banged the ruler on the desk and called out, yes, yes, yes. Ah, the small, sad pleasure of being right. I wish my mother and father would, would have been able to open a window and look in to see their own personalities and to have found me sitting in there waiting for them so they could have opened a window in me too. But it didn't happen. And we all three stayed who we didn't think we were. It's too bad. We could have known how wonderful we were. When I was a sensitive adolescent, pink clouds in a blue sky sent me into a cylinder of pleasure. So now that I'm old, I see them and as if they were peasants walking past me on a country lane, I simply nod, happy enough just to see them, with no cylinder involved. It's satisfying to eat exactly the right amount of, say, uh, French toast, and then stop. For you have just achieved a moral victory in the middle of the flow of time. And though it flows away, this victory, you have its aftertaste, along with butter and genuine Vermont maple syrup from a tree not far down the road. When my granddaughter saw me today, a radiant smile lit up her face and my face opened up too with a smile that said, I love you, and she knew. Then we looked away and became slightly somebody else. I'm sure I'm not the only person my age who is still asking the same questions about existence and life in existence that I asked in adolescence. But sometimes when I look at the faces of people my age, all I see is loaves of bread smiling as if baking had been a great pleasure. Last week, there was one wasp in this room. Yesterday, two. Today, five. In a month, there'll be enough of them to pick me up and throw me against the wall. But apparently they don't care about me at all. And honestly, I don't care about them either.
wasn't it the Bible that said, blessed art thou among women? I'm taking those words for myself as I am blessed, nay, blessed to be in a house with one of them, my wife, the most beautiful old woman in the world. There is nothing more beautiful than a beautiful old woman. I noticed a black thing, a chocolate cake crumb, a single mouse dropping. And for a moment, I didn't want it to be there on my desk. So I flicked it off and onto the floor. Now it's down there. I wonder what it is. As a young man, I wanted to live a long time so I could know what it feels like to be old. Now I'm trying to remember <laughs> what it feels like to be young. Young, old, old, young. Do you need more proof of how ridiculous I am? If so, look inside yourself, for you are just like me. There is nothing more ridiculous than a human being. The rest of nature doesn't know this. It's our little secret. I put some stamps on the envelope. Maybe enough, I don't know. The post office should accept it as is because I made an effort. The post office should look at the envelope and say, well, he made an effort. I had a friend, an old Vermonter who lived in the house he was born in. Oh, I'm sorry. Oh yeah, I'm sorry. Excuse me, reset. I had a friend, an old Vermonter who died in the house he was born in at 94 alone. His name was Harold Clough. He did manual work all his life until he quit working around the age of 87. I just looked at the picture of him on my wall and wondered what he'd think of me now. I never heard him say anything good or bad about anyone. In fact, I never heard him say anything about anyone. He was always quietly happy. There's nothing like the sight of a house, lights on in the dark winter night, to make you feel close to all the humans inside that house and out. Pretty great to love humanity, if only for a moment. This is actually the title, it's called Naked Dinner. At the dinner table last night, I was chewing and looking across the room at nothing and when everything locked into place, me too, in real time, which had stopped. It was too much. I let the universe go and went on chewing. Joe Brainerd said, the reason I'm a painter is because I'm not a movie star. The reason I'm a poet is because I'm not a zebra. I am though, for a moment, caught inside the word zebra, Z to A. And I alternate from inside this page and outside it, inside, out, and so on. Joe, a movie star? Yeah, he was kidding you. He was a star, period. Jesus would have made things a lot easier if he had written his memoirs, but he was too busy being Jesus, I suppose. That's pretty much all I have to say about him right now. 
He's like mercury. You touch it and it slips away, then stops and waits for you to try again. Eh, he's too hide and seek for me. That cave, for instance. I sat around until it was dark and had a cigarette the same one I smoked in 1958 in a hotel room in Mexico at night with 12 girls smoking Mexican cigarettes and laughing into the smoke of each other's breaths. It was a Delgado, slightly flattened and with pinstripes running along its length that went all the way to a little Mexican infinity inside me. When I was 10 years old, I set up a target in our backyard. And from the front yard, I shot arrows over the roof. You'd be surprised how quickly a kid can get good at it. This was a skill that later served me well when I faced the challenges of adult life. It allowed me never to become a dolt. I only have about 50 more, okay? Uh, <laughs> a, a blue hen, I'm sorry, a blue hen and a yellow egg appeared on the piece of paper and disappeared. Where did they come from and where go? Why do I have to ask? I should just be glad they came to see me in beautiful blue and yellow. What is, it, what is it that, in the face of death, lets you find yourself sitting in a chair with happiness all around you, and in you, and of you, as if you were a dog whose master is petting you and telling you how good you are forever? <clears throat> And this is the last one. <clears throat> there aren't many more pages in this notebook. I'm, I'll be sorry when they run out, when they run out of emptiness. There can't be many more years to my life. Boo hoo. Then I'll go on to a new notebook, hopefully one without metaphors. But don't get me wrong. I like metaphors quite a lot. In fact, I live in one, a book. That's it. Thank you, everybody. Uh, Ron Padgett. Thank you, sir. <laughs> wow. Wow. It's been too long since you've been in Detroit. Uh, I remember you reading in the English department many years ago and just hearing you again reminds me of how good it is and how thought provoking and funny. I remember, <laughs> so does I any, remember that reading. Yeah, Can you hear me still? I remember yeah. that reading. Uh, uh, it was a very nice evening and a uh, wonderful audience. And uh, a, a really great moment was when I, I went outside afterwards and I, uh, into the where my car was parked, and it was a very nice, uh, I think, sort of summer night or spring night. It was very pleasant, and this beautiful young woman came walking toward me, and she said, "Am I too late?" And I said, "Yeah, you are." <laughs> and, and and we had a wonderful conversation. It was Carla Harriman, actually, and it was a, a very. It was actually better than the reading. <laughs> <laughs> So uh, does anybody want to post a question or just shout one out um, for Ron uh, or any of the writers? Uh, Ron, is it is the, all those new poems that you've been writing uh, and collecting, is there a prospect for a book in the near future? I don't, I don't know. I, that's, that's my answer. I, <laughs> I didn't know if you were working towards one. Or... No, I don't ever work toward uh, any books, no. Uh, yeah, no. Good stuff. 
you know, stuff. I have a question for George. Is George there? Yeah, he's up there. George. Turn on your mic, George. George, is your mic on? Yeah, I'm okay. Uh, George. Poems. The previous book that I published called The Slip, which was also from uh, Blazebox, ended up with these very one word line, one word per line poems. Mm -hmm. And they intrigued me because I felt like, well, this is weird. You know, like I, I'm not used to doing that. I mean, I've seen, you know, I, I've always been a big fan of minimalism. Uh, Aram Saroyan, Robert Creeley, uh, it's a, and, and I, I've always liked your uh, nothing in that drawer. I always thought that was like an amazing sonnet. <laughs> Well, but, but no, but so I so I, I got to this point where I just felt like, well, let's see if I could write a whole book like that. And, and, and you know, that that corny expression of a picture is worth a thousand words. Mm -hmm. And I just felt like, well, what is the thousand words and how would you get them? And I, so I figured, well, OK, what if I just wrote a hundred pages and 10 words per page? And then the question was, how do you line up the words on the page? And a single column is easy to say, but then I, but I didn't just do that. I, I broke them up into little stanzas, like couplets and tercets, et cetera, all the way down the page. So each, each one of those is different. You can't see that. You can't hear that when I'm reading them. Hmm. But I mean, it just sort of, it, it sort of reminded me of haiku. I mean, that whole book is very much drenched in, in Tang Dynasty Chinese poetry, which I've been reading a lot of. It's like a, a like a, a resin that kind of covers the whole thing. Yeah. And, and I studied Mandarin for about three years, you know, and all I learned was about some, a few characters and, and that whole, all that sort of came together in my head. I wanted to do something minimalist and sort of Asian. Uh -huh. Thank but you. Anyway, th thanks for yeah. the question. Do you know David Hinton's translations? Uh, from Tang Dynasty poets, uh, they're very good. I, I mean, I, they, they read great in English anyway. Yeah, yeah, I have a, a bunch of different b translations of uh, Dofu and uh, Li Bei and all the, all these other guys. And I think I had that book by David. Yeah. 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 There's some amazing uh, different works th that have come out of those translations. Yeah. Speaking of translations, I was just using uh, your translations of, of Reverdy's prose poems with my poetry workshop. Are you working on any more translations? Uh, no. <laughs> it's too hard. <laughs> yeah. Well, you, I, you and Chris should translate more. I think you're so you're so bilingual and so such good writers. You're naturals, you know. Yeah, like like you got us into doing Julie or the Rose. <laughs> I remember oh, what you did. Oh, that's true. I talked I talked those two into translating Apollinaire's pornographic poetry. This <laughs> is an in Paris in 1966, I think, a spring. Man, you forever rotted our brains. <laughs> <laughs> it was great. We, we went on to, to have in-camera press, which, which was devoted to pornography. <laughs> <laughs> That's what we love about you. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> Other questions? Oh, here's one if just uh, from someone. Um, Ron, did you know my friend Irving Stetner from East Village? Your poetry is different than his, but you both write lighthearted about your life, at least from what you read tonight. Uh, I didn't know Irving personally, but uh, he came to uh, readings and events at the St. Mars Poetry Project, which I also went to. And I, I sort of met him there, and, and, but I, I can't say I really knew him, but I did know of his work, yeah. Yeah. Okay. Anybody else? Questions? I, I would like to ask Chris what she's working on now, actually. I might have missed, she might have said something earlier, but uh, by the way, Chris, I love your new book, by the way. The, uh, uh, thank you, Ron. Thank you. Um, actually, I'm doing a collaboration with George. I've never collaborated. And uh, his. George Tish? Yeah. <laughs> Be George Tish. What's the, what's the world coming to? Uh, he, uh, he read from his new series, 26 uh, Tears, 
Yes. So I'm doing it backwards. I'm starting with Z and going to A and just taking a few words from each of his poems. And so um, I, I, I love having that structure. So I wrote 10 already. So we'll see where that takes me. She writes in, that in her head when she's supposed uh -oh. to be sleeping. She's the <laughs> new Robert Desnos. <laughs> yeah, <right. laughs> she wakes up in the morning and says, I couldn't sleep all night. I was writing a poem. And I said, oh, great. Why don't you stop <laughs> doing that? <laughs> <laughs> Anybody else? <laughs> yeah, I have, a, I have a question. I don't know if I'm being heard or not. Yes, you are. Yes, heard. Oh, that's great. So, so Ron, I know that you have been uh, dispossessed now for a year from your normal writing environment. And yeah. just wondered whether being here in Vermont um, and obviously with some of the some of the poems with uh are effect, effect are affected by being here but i wondered if it has affected your practice your daily routine your and how that has kind of uh transformed or not just how you've been thinking uh i'm going to answer that question which was delivered by ed corin whom many of you will know is the great uh cartoonist for The New Yorker uh, and other places, and also a wonderful graphic artist. Um, uh, Ed, uh, what, what did you ask me? <laughs> no, <laughs> no uh, I, don't, I don't know. I've never, I don't have a regular routine that I follow all the time. I just, but here in Vermont, uh, out in the sticks, where it's, as you, well, Ed also lives in Vermont, and, uh, and it's very, very quiet up here. Uh, I'm on a somewhat remote road, uh, so there's a lot of silence up here. And we, when the snow mm -hmm. falls and covers the ground, it gets even quieter. And there are no cars, and it's just amazing. And then the day can seem extremely long. I mean, you have so much time. And so I found that I uh, went out into a little studio across the road and took a, uh, this is back in, uh, we got, got up here in this past March. And uh, later in the month, I took a little, I found an a empty notebook out in that studio and I started writing, going out there and writing in it. And it, it kind of got to be like uh, going to work. You know, you get your lunch pail and you go to work. And I would go out and sit out there and, and look around and write some things and they'd come back in the house. And I, I did it the next day and the next day and I got to like it. Uh, and then after a while, it got boring. And so I stopped <laughs> doing it. And uh, but I can't say that I have a regular work routine. I'm not, uh, I'm not like prose writers who get up in the morning and write 200 words and sharpen their pencils and all that sort of stuff. So. No, I never presumed that you had a routine, but I just wondered how just being but, here affected your, your, how you went about thinking and feeling and looking. Oh, and you, I, just, I, you just answered that. I mean, and I, and I have no idea how I think. <laughs> <laughs> but we do. So it's, something, it's, something that hap it's something that happens to me. I don't have any much to do with it. <laughs> I, know, I know the feeling. I know the, part, the way. It anyway, it's good to see you, Ed. You look good. Um, I, I was going to uh, ask a question, just um, a logistical question, and then a, a one about your poetry. Um, is, so you're in Vermont, which is a small state. So have you gotten your vaccination? <laughs> yes, only a very small vaccination, though. <laughs> <laughs> I think it's called a mosquito bite or something. <laughs> well, is it easier to get the Pfizer or Moderna shot up there than it say it would be in Los Angeles? <laughs> Well, my, if my experience and the experience of my wife is any indication, it was very easy. Uh, but, just but it was just recently. It was, uh, in fact, uh, two weeks ago tonight, today, that we got it. But a uh, very nice woman gave us, stuck the needle in our arms and told us nice things. And so, uh, yeah, it was, it was nice. My sister-in-law, who lives in New York, uh, had a lot of trouble. And other friends in New York City have had trouble trying to just get a hold of anybody to make an appointment. So maybe it is easier here, but I, I don't know, really. It was pretty nice here. And then the other question is, what book are the Patterson poems in? 
Uh, well, the, the four of them are in that big, huge doorstop book of mine you held up. Yeah, yeah. Collected poems. And then three were written uh, specifically for the film. Uh -huh. So they weren't in a book. Oh, OK. OK. I thought maybe you did Although, a little chat. Maybe they're no, no, uh, uh no. Jim Jarmusch is is really uh, uh, very uh, popular in uh, Europe, and so over there, those poems got translated into I don't know all kinds of languages and stuff, uh, German, and, uh, you know. Yeah. But, uh, anyway. Well, I was just watching his uh, uh, Iggy uh, film, and I remembered watching it, and then. The Patterson film where the guys in the bar and there's a picture of uh, Iggy Stooge uh, hanging on the bar wall there. Right. Anybody else? Well, I appreciate all of you taking time and, and coming uh, to hear these poets read tonight. This has been a very special reading for me. I've known the Tishas for a long time. In fact, I was thinking tonight uh, George had me on his radio show, I think it was 1975, so uh, that was a very early uh, break for me, and I'm always appreciative of that. And of course, he ran the Great Line series, where I was thinking about that too, because I met Ferlin Getty through his series uh, there, and Larry just passed away um, two days ago, so. Interesting question. So I, I think Siri's talking to me or something. Um, anyway, so thank you guys. The next reading is going to be the All Access Cafe that I do with uh, differently abled writers and musicians. And we're going to have uh, Dana Gioia is going to pipe in from um, Cal up Northern California. Paul Guest from Virginia, I believe he's at. And um, Joe Kidd from Detroit here. We'll do a little music. So that's happening on March 21st. It will be a Sunday. And then a special Sunday event um, will be April the 11th. And I'll be joined by John Densmore of The Doors and, um, and Ruben Guevara of Ruben and the Jets, both coming live from Los Angeles. So um, April 1st, I'm planning an April 1st reading with uh, some of the younger beat guys like Andy Clausen's going to be there and Danny Schott and um, David Cope. And I'm trying to make connections with Antler, but he might be sleeping up in the uh, UP in the woods right now, eating berries or something like that. So if, he, uh, if we can get him on some kind of, of uh, camera, that'd be great. Okay, well, thanks everyone. Appreciate it. Thanks again to Poets and Writers, to Chris Tish, George Tish, and Ron Paget for tuning in tonight. And we'll have uh, Robin Eichley do a, do a nice, uh, put some titles and labels on it. We'll repost it with that. Thanks, okay. Ron. Thanks, Ron. Thanks, everybody, Thanks, everybody Thank for coming. Thank yeah. you. Bye. George. Thanks, Chris. Thank you. Thank, Thank you, Ron. You. you too, George. Be good. Say hello to Patty. Will do. <laughs> oh, I meant to say I was, Ed Sanders was in my class online and he sends his uh, hellos and love to the Tishas and Ron. I told him Ron was going to be on, so uh, he said to mention that. I, I wanted to say it's great to see so many people that I haven't seen in about 30 years or so. Isn't that great? <laughs> 30 years, it's great. Yeah, it's great. Awesome. John Godfrey, and it's great. Kid Robinson. Laura Grimshaw. You know, Maureen there. Owen. Yeah, Maureen Owens there. Oh, wow. Maureen, she was an artist. I got her books are on my shelves outside my office there. And I never met Charlie North, but there he is. Hi, oh, Charlie. wow. Yeah. Look at that. Yeah, Tony, I gotta... Tony Toll was here, too. Thank you. Bye, bye. Right. Bye, Ron. Bye, bye bye. See you guys. Thanks. Bye -bye. Bye -bye. Support Poetry and Bookbeat, where you can purchase books by Ron Padgett, Chris Tisch, and George Tisch. Online at the URL listed here on the screen or by phone at 248-968-1190.